the blood will never, ever lose its power. The blood of the covenant poured out for us from the Lord, our Lamb. Praise the Lord. Thank you, praise team. Thank you so much. Appreciate y'all. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord is the lamb, the sacrificial lamb who takes away the sins of the world. Through his atoning sacrifice, the Lord, the lamb. Anyone here from New York City? Somebody say, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you got some New Yorkers in the house? Okay, wh where are you from? Which, which borough, sorry? Brooklyn? Okay, we got Bro Brooklyn in the house. <laughs> got Brooklyn? Queens? Okay. Bronx? Okay. East Harlem? Okay, East Harlem. All right. Brooklyn? Okay. What was that? Flatbush. Flat, see, all these, all these cities and boroughs, I'm sure they mean something to y'all. <laughs> I'm a suburban boy. <laughs> it's all, all New York. <laughs> Shoot, man, you know, I'm from Burlington, <laughs> Willingboro, New Jersey. <laughs> he said, what? <laughs> Burlington Township High School. <laughs> 295, exit 47, you know, it's real. I'm not used to those one-way streets. I'm used to, to park with highways, you know. <laughs> but New York, I've noticed that people from New York, they have a certain pride about being from New York, am I right? Now, most of us know where New York is, but how about York? There's New York, but what about York? Do you know where York is? I said, PA. I'm sure there is a York and PA too. But why is New York called New York? Apparently, it was controlled by the Dutch. When it was controlled by the Dutch, New York was previously called New Amsterdam. But after the Dutch surrendered it to the English in 1664, King Charles of England granted the land to his brother James, and James was the Duke of York. The Duke of York. Now, although even today in England, there's an old city called York, it's safe to say that it's been surpassed by the greatness of New York. Just ask someone from New York. They'll tell you it's the greatest city ever. She said it is. <laughs> now, is anyone here from New Jersey? Okay, we got some Jersey in the house. <laughs> I'm from New Jersey, born and raised in Anyone proud to be from New Jersey? Amen. Jersey pride? Okay. Well, likewise, New Jersey is named after an island in the English Channel. Apparently, the same Duke of York, he granted the land to a couple of loyal friends from the Channel Island of Jersey, the Channel Island of Jersey, and they called it New Jersey. There's New York, there's New Jersey. There's an old York, there's a New York, there's a Jersey, and there's a New Jersey. Now, whether or not you think it's great to be in NJ or great to be in NYC, we can all say it's great to be in JC, in Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Lamb. And although there's an old covenant, it's been surpassed by the greatness of the new covenant. There's an old Jersey, but it's been surpassed by the greatness of New Jersey. There's an old covenant that's been surpassed by the greatness of the new covenant. And the new covenant, the New Testament, was established by the sacrificial blood of Jesus Christ, which was poured out for many. And Jesus tells this to his disciples during the Last Supper, where he institutes a new Passover. A new Passover. In the old Passover, the Jews would commemorate the Lord's salvation from slavery to Egypt. In the new Passover, Christians commemorate the Lord's salvation from slavery to sin. 
And today I'd like to talk a little bit about this new Passover that we call the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table, Communion. Whatever you call it, it's to be a celebration of our salvation, a commemoration of our justification. Now, speaking of cities, consider the following sentence. There was a pileup on the Betsy Ross, so I took Ben Franklin to work. There was a pileup on Betsy Ross, so I took Ben Franklin to work. Now, if you've driven in Philadelphia before, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Right? There was an accident on the Betsy Ross Bridge, so I crossed the Ben Franklin Bridge instead to avoid traffic on the way to work. The meaning of Betsy Ross, Ben Franklin, pile up, that expression, is clear to us in our context. But if you're not familiar with our context, the sentence can sound like a woman named Betsy is somewhere underneath some people. So I took a guy named Ben to my job. Context is important. You see, when talking to people in our context, the meaning of certain proper nouns and expressions, it needs no explanation. But when we read scripture that was written centuries and millennia ago, it does require some explanation. We have to try to understand what certain proper nouns and expressions mean in that context. So let's examine some of the context of communion, the new Passover. Beginning in Mark 14, 12, it says, Then, on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when they would sacrifice the Passover lamb, his disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations so that you can eat the Passover meal? Mark 14, 12. Now, technically, Passover lambs, they were slain on Thursday afternoon, and at sundown that same evening, the Feast of Unleavened Bread began. Here, the word day does not likely refer to a a precise 24-hour period. But in any case, the Festival of Unleavened Bread, what was that? It was one of the three festivals that the Lord commanded the Israelites to celebrate each and every year. We see this festival first mentioned in Exodus 12, when the Lord is about to send the plague of the firstborn and deliver his people from the Egyptian oppressors. As you may recall, through Moses and Aaron, the Lord has repeatedly told Pharaoh to let his people go. Let my people go. And we said a couple weeks ago, why did the Lord want Pharaoh to let his people go? So they could worship him. He says it over and over again. As we're reading again, the Lord commands him to release the Lord's people so the Lord's people can reverence the Lord. They are to be freed from slavery so that they can be free to serve. God saves them so they can serve him. Likewise, through Christ, we have been freed from slavery to sin so that we can be free to serve. But for a while, Pharaoh refuses to release Israel, whom God calls his firstborn son. So because they would not let God's son depart, Egypt's sons would have to depart. And to be saved from the plague of the firstborn, the Israelites were commanded to slay a lamb. Then as we see in Exodus 12, 7 to 8, the Lord says, Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Bread made without yeast. It's Exodus 12, 7, 8. Continuing in verse 13, it says, The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Verse 14, this is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days, you are to eat bread made without yeast. Exodus 12, 13 to 15a. Now, during this sacred time, the Israelites, they couldn't do any work except to prepare food. And no one was to eat any food with any yeast. Also, they were, had, they were supposed to have sacred assemblies on the first day and the seventh day of this festival. Then as we see in Exodus 12, 17, it says, Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread 
Because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. You see, the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread, they were to be lasting ordinances, lasting reminders, lasting commemorations of the salvation of the Lord. Now, you ever oversleep for something? You ever wake up, look at the clock, and feel that sensation of just sheer panic? You'd be like, oh, what time is it? Whoa! And you jump out of bed, you just got to get ready. You just got to go. You know you have to get out the door as soon as possible. No time to shower. (laughs) Somebody said, I make time to shower now. (laughs) I was clean when I went to bed last night. No time to shower. Might have to just throw on some deodorant. No time to brush your teeth. Come on, somebody said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm just going to have to be late. (laughs) Might have to just grab some trident on the way out. You know, it's true. Some winter green. It ain't going to (laughs) work. No time to fix your hair. No time to put on makeup. No time to shave. It's time to go. Well, after the plague of the firstborn, after Pharaoh finally frees Israel, it was time to go. There was no time to bake bread with yeast and wait for the yeast to make the bread rise. They just had to pack unleavened bread. There was no time to waste. It was time to go. And the Lord, he wants them to remember this time. Remember that time when you didn't have no time to put no yeast in the bread? Every single year, you're going to celebrate the feast, the festival of unleavened bread. Remember what I did for you when I brought you out of Egypt. Every year, at the same time, that it celebrate the festival of unleavened bread and the Passover. Just a little context. Continuing to Mark 14, 13, it says, And he sends two of his disciples and says to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Now, Jesus tells him to go. He tells them to go into the city. Now, what city? The city of Jerusalem. For the Lord had commanded the Jews to only sacrifice and eat the Passover lamb in the holy city. We see that in Deuteronomy 16. Now, this could be evidence of Christ's supernatural foreknowledge. He knew, maybe he knew that someone was going to be there that was going to meet them. But it's likely that Jesus had already made arrangements with this guy. And the fact that it's a man is kind of important because in that context, only women would carry water jars. So that a man was carrying a water jar, that could be a signal. You see, you know, when you preach the gospel, you preach it truly, you're going to make some enemies. You're, going, you're, not going, you're going to lose some friends. You know, Jesus was, was healing people, driving out demons, preaching the good news, the gospel of the kingdom, and they're trying to kill him. But when Jesus, when he sets his face towards Jerusalem, when he starts heading towards Jerusalem, He knows he's headed towards his death. So he didn't want to set things in motion too fast. So they probably had this little cloak and dagger approach. All right, when you see a man with a water jar, he's going to meet up with you. Go follow him. He was already making waves, and this signal would allow them to identify and accompany this man without drawing too much attention to themselves. Picking up at verse 14, it says, And wherever he enters... Wherever this guy enters, tell the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover meal with my disciples? And he will show you a large upstairs room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. Verse 16, the disciples left and went into the city and found things just as he had told them. And they made preparations for the Passover. Now the homeowner likely has some financial means since it was a, at least a two-story house. They had an upstairs room. You know, that's, you, you know you're moving on up, you got an upstairs room. <laughs> and the disciples, they likely found the upstairs room already furnished and ready. Likely had some cushions, likely had some carpets. Everything was already set. Verse 17, and when evening came, 
he arrives with the 12. While they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus says, amen. Amen means truly. When you say amen, that's like truly. I, I affirm that. Jesus says, amen. Truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. One who eats with me. One who eats with me. Now, while we sit and eat at a table, back in the day, Jews would recline and eat at a table. And when evening came, as we see here, and Jewish thinking, it was now technically the next day, sundown to sundown. Recall the Passover had to be eaten at night. So at this time, likely in April, the sun usually set in Jerusalem around 6 p.m. So it's, you know, it's the evening time. And the Passover meal was usually eaten by one or two families, just one or two families. It was an intimate affair. It wasn't a whole bunch of people. And notice here that Christ is not necessarily eating this intimate meal with his closest family, but with his closest followers. Not his biological brothers, but with his spiritual brothers. Now, earlier flashback in in Mark 3, Christ's biological mother and brothers were standing outside while his spiritual brothers were inside. And someone says, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. And in Mark 3, 34 and 35, it says that Jesus looks at those around him and says, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. You see, our relationship with our kin is important. But not as important as our relationship with our Christ. As been said, not all of our skin folk are kin folk. And though we may not be able to celebrate the new Passover with everyone in our biological family, we should always do so with our spiritual family. And although we may not be blood brothers and sisters, we are brothers and sisters through the blood of Christ. Now, even though our Lord and Savior is with his spiritual family during the Last Supper, we know that one of those present will betray him. One who even has the audacity to sit there and eat with him. Now, back in the day, and, and even now to some degree, people just didn't break bread with anybody. When you shared a table with someone, it formed or reinforced an intimate bond, an intimate table fellowship bond. And the fact that the betrayer, who was elsewhere identified, of course, as Judas Iscariot, is sharing bread with Jesus. This recalls the words of Psalm 41.9, which says, Even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread, has turned against me. Psalm 41.9. Now, it could be that Judas was eating with Jesus right at that very moment, like they're both chewing at the same time. He could have been identifying Judas right then and there. But it doesn't seem like it, given how the disciples react. As we see in Mark 14, 19, it says, And they began to be sorrowful and to say to him one by one, Surely not I. Couldn't be me. You don't mean me, do you? Now, if it was clear at that point that it was Judas, then they wouldn't have asked that question. But everyone's like, no, it couldn't be me. Couldn't be me. In verse 20, but he said to them, it is one of the 12. One who dips with me in the dish. One who dips with me in the dish. So the person who was to hand Jesus over on a platter ate from the same platter as Jesus. They dipped in the same dish, the same bowl. You know, back then they would place a bowl in the center of the table in which everyone at the table would dip their bread. Imagine that everyone dipping from the same bowl. This is an intimate affair, I told you. Oh, it gets even better. Now, this dipping into the dish could be literal. In fact, during the Passover meal, Jews were to dip food into bitter herbs. We've seen that early in Exodus. They were to dip their food in bitter herbs. Or dipping in the same dish could just be an expression. It could just refer generally to sharing a meal with someone. Now, have you ever seen someone dip their chip in some dip? Take a bite of that chip? And dip that same chip back in the dip? I think they call that double dipping. 
how many of us would dip one of our chips back into that same dip? I bet most of us wouldn't be too comfortable eating with a double dipper. As been said, they need to flip that chip before they double dip. (laughs) Now, how many of us would share a bowl of dipping sauce with a stranger today? Even if they weren't double dipping, I doubt many of us would. Truth be told, given everything that's been going on, many people don't feel comfortable eating around people at all, let alone sharing some dipping sauce, some Polynesian sauce. Oh, that's some good sauce right there. You know what I'm talking about. I got it from the bottle one. They sell it by the bottle. I was like, really? I'm sorry. I'm getting off track. But some people don't feel comfortable, you know, eating around anybody, you know. Some people won't take their mask off around anybody. And, you know, back in the day, you know, Scott and family uh, affairs, I wouldn't say they were an intimate meal, you know, because we'd just be packing people in there, like 50, 60 people in, in one house. <laughs> that, that's how we used to do. But, you know, when everything happened, you know, we'd go over to Grandma's house, and she would make all this food. She'd make it in the kitchen real good, smelling good. You take your plate, you make your plate, and you go into the car. <laughs> I, you know, I get a plate for me, a plate for Kristen, and I eat, you know, my plate and her plate in the car. <laughs> it wasn't eating around everyone, you know, in the house. But, you know, nowadays things are loosening up, Lord willing. But even nowadays, you know, we might not eat with just anybody, but we'll make some exceptions. We'll make some exceptions for those we are closest to. Likewise, Jews only dipped in the same dish with those they were closest to. They dipped in the same dish and he betrayed them. One of Christ's closest followers betrays Jesus. You know, those who are closest to us, they're the ones close enough to stab us in the back. So Jesus says in Mark 14, 21, for the son of man goes just as it has been written about him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for him if that man had not been born. Mark 14, 21. Now, last time, you know, we talked about how Son of Man is a divine title from Daniel 7, 13, and 14. And we saw how in in Mark 14, 61 and 64, when Jesus appropriates this title of divine authority, the Jewish leaders condemn him to death for blasphemy. Son of Man is a divine title. And Christ says that he, the Son of Man, will go away. He will die, just as it's been written. As we said, Jesus is also the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, who will give his life as an offering for sin. But for the one who betrays Jesus, Christ says it would have been better for him if he had never been born. This is a common biblical proclamation of judgment. Suffice it to say, things aren't going to go too well for Judas. Verse 22, and while they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after he gave a blessing, he broke it and gave it to them and said, take it, this is my body. This is my body. Now, as the saying goes, some people think they're the greatest thing since sliced bread. Well, back in the day, Jews, they didn't even slice bread. They would break it. They would break loaves. But like we do today, they would bless the table before they ate. Now, you know, if I'm honest, sometimes, you know, I, I don't really say grace to like that third or fourth bite. I'm like, God is great. God is good. Oh, this food is good too. And we thank you for this food. <laughs> sometimes you forget. You're supposed to say the blessing, you know, before you get into the food. I'm not perfect. <laughs> But here, this blessing actually refers to praising God. We say, bless the Lord. They're blessing God. And the Jewish blessing that was customarily pronounced over the bread was this. Blessed be thou, O Lord, our God, King of the world, who causest bread to come forth from the earth. In our society, so many are concerned with making more and more 
bread. Everybody wants to make some bread, right? But it's always important to give thanks to the one who makes it possible for bread to be made. And the special blessing pronounced over the Passover bread was this. This is the bread of affliction our ancestors ate when they came from Egypt. This is the bread of affliction our ancestors ate when they came out of Egypt. Again, the Passover was a commemoration of the Lord's salvation from slavery to Egypt. The bread was symbolic. Likewise, the new Passover is a commemoration of the Lord's salvation from slavery to sin. And the bread is symbolic. You see, the Jews did not think the bread they were eating was literally 1,300 years old. It was not literally the bread of their ancestors they were eating. Nor is the bread Jesus and the disciples are currently eating. It's not literally his body. It's a metaphor. Jesus says, this is my body, symbolically, metaphorically. Now, although Catholics believe in transubstantiation, transubstantiation that the bread and wine literally become the body and blood of Jesus during communion, we maintain that it is symbolic, a memorial. It was a symbolic memorial of the body of Jesus Christ, which was broken for us. See, the Passover meal had lots of symbolism, bread, the cup. There was salt water. There was herbs. There's all these different things about the Passover meal. And Jesus reinterprets the symbolism. There was an old covenant, and there's a new covenant that surpasses. There's an old Passover, there's a new Passover that Christ surpasses. He reinterprets the symbolism. Continuing it in verse 23 and 24, it says, Then he took a cup, and after he gave thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Mark 14, 23 and 24. Now, I know some people, we, we, we only want to, you know, share a dish nowadays. Who would share a cup? You see, back in the day, during the Passover, they would drink four cups of wine. Sounds like a party, doesn't it? Four cups of wine. But they would have one cup that would go around. And everyone would take a sip. That probably gives you anxiety. Just think about it, don't it? <laughs> but four cups of wine sounds like a party. And yes, this was not grape juice. This was wine. In fact, grape juice wasn't even a thing until about 1869. You see, there was no way to stop the yeast in the grapes from fermenting until they developed pasteurization in the 1860s. But in the 1860s, it was a Methodist minister who used pasteurization to kill the yeast in grape juice and refrigeration to keep the unfermented juice fresh. And his name may sound a little bit familiar. His name was Dr. Thomas Bramwell Welch. Don't believe me? Look it up. Yes, Welch's grape juice was first made as a non-alcoholic unfermented wine for communion. And that's some good juice, too, man. <laughs> and I drink that juice. I just start thinking about Jesus every time I drink that juice. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So suffice to say, in Christ's day, there was no juice. There was no grape juice. They were drinking wine. There's no way to stop it from fermenting. But it was not undiluted wine. I want to be very careful here. Wine was usually diluted with water. About two to four parts water per every part wine. Now, drinking undiluted, strong drink was actually frowned upon back then. You didn't drink straight wine. Scripture doesn't condemn alcoholic drinks, but getting drunk from alcohol. We're not to be filled with the spirits. We're to be filled with the spirit. And as you'll even see in 1 Corinthians 11, 21, Paul has to correct the Corinthian church since some people were apparently getting drunk during communion. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty one. 21. Some people was eating a whole bunch, and some people had a little. Some people had a little bit to drink, and some people was getting drunk off the blood of Jesus. <laughs> oh, my goodness. In any case, back in the day, everyone would share one cup of wine that was, was passed around. This was a very intimate affair. You didn't break bread with just anybody. You didn't, you didn't just dip in a dish with, this, with, with just anybody. You didn't share the cup 
with just anybody. Very intimate. And Jesus says, blood of the covenant. This is one of these expressions that has a certain context. In context, blood of the covenant is an expression that alludes to Exodus 24. Exodus 24. I want to go through a little bit of scripture. You see, back in the day, sacrificial blood was used to ratify covenants. It was used to ratify covenants. And the old covenant, the Old Testament between God and Israel, which was proclaimed at Mount Sinai, was sealed in blood. Nowadays, see, sometimes people might, you know, when I was young, we do a pinky promise, right? I mean, you did a pinky promise, you couldn't break that word, man. They say, what, well, bird is bond? <laughs> but back in the day, you would seal a covenant with blood. You see, after the Lord gives Israel the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 and in several other laws, it says in Exodus 24, 3 to 7, when Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice, everything the Lord has said, we will do. Everything you say, God, we're going to do it. Verse 4, Moses then wrote down everything the Lord has said. He got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent young Israelite men, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in bowls, and the other half he splashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They responded, we will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. Exodus 24, 3 to 7. You see, at Mount Sinai, the Israelites agreed to all the terms of the old covenant. And now they were going to seal the covenant with blood. In Exodus 24, 8, it says, Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, this is the blood of the covenant. This is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Exodus 24, verse 8. You see, as sacrificial blood sealed the old covenant at Sinai, sacrificial blood sealed the new covenant at Calvary. And the prophesied new covenant entails the forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins. As you read in Hebrews 9, 20 to 22, referring to Moses says, he said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. Verse 22, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Thanks be to God, Jesus Christ shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins. As we see in the parallel passage in Matthew 26, 28, Jesus says at the Last Supper, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And in Luke, Luke 22, 20, Jesus says in the same way, it says in Luke 22, 20, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. The new covenant. And Paul reminds the Corinthians about Christ's words at the Last Supper in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five, 25, which says, in the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The old covenant was sealed with blood and the new covenant is sealed in blood. The blood of Jesus Christ, the Lord, our lamb. Just a little more scripture. Now, the the prophet Jeremiah prophesied about this new covenant. The new covenant he talks about in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, which says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. 
No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Who's thankful for forgiveness today? Amen. So Jesus is fulfilling words concerning the covenant foretold in the Old Testament. He reinterprets the symbolism of the Passover meal. He said, this bread, now this bread is my body. Now this cup is my blood. The blood of the new covenant that's poured out for many. Communion is to be a commemoration of the Lord's salvation the Lord's forgiveness of sins through the prophesied new covenant. And the new covenant is ratified by the blood of the Redeemer, the blood that was poured out for the many. Now, last time we talked about our great Savior and his great service. We saw that in Mark 10, 45, he says in Mark 10, 45, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We said that Jesus is likely alluding to the prophecy about the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. In in Isaiah 53, it says that the servant was to be pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. It says he was led like a lamb to the slaughter, though he did no wrong. And once again, Isaiah 53, 10 to 12 says, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, He will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, after he's died, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. Justification. And he will bear their iniquities. Verse 12. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Isaiah 53, 10 to 12. As we said, one single life is given in exchange for many. Jesus paid all the costs when he was slayed on the cross. He paid the price and made it right. He made it right between us and God the Father, bringing about a new covenantal relationship. We were made righteous in God's sight, for the servant justifies many. He justifies many by bearing the consequences of our sin, by paying the ransom payment, the redemption price. Christ poured out, that is, he shed his blood, covering our sin debts. And without the shedding of blood, there could be no forgiveness. And just as the Israelites were saved from death by the blood of the Passover lamb, we are saved from eternal death by the blood of Christ, our Passover lamb, our Lord, our lamb. Verse 25, it says, amen. I say to you that I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Now, as you said, during the Passover, it was customary to to drink four cups of wine. It would be passed around. And before the fourth cup, they would pronounce a blessing over the bread. But after giving the blessing, Jesus says he will no longer drink any fruit of the vine, the grapevine. He's not going to drink any more wine until he drinks it new in the kingdom of God. Now, drinking it new could mean that Jesus would drink wine in a new way. Or it could refer to Jesus drinking wine new wine. And if it is new wine, this would be an allusion to the great messianic banquet, the banquet of the Messiah, when the kingdom of God was fully consummated. You see, that that the consummation of the kingdom of God is often portrayed as a great banquet, a messianic banquet. For example, Isaiah 25, 6 says about that time, on this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples a feast, a rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine. 
the best of meats and the finest of wines. Also, Amos 9, 13 says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine, new wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. Amos 9, 13. Metaphorically, there will be an unending supply of new wine. Now, do you recall what Christ's first miracle was? What was Jesus' first miracle? Turning water into wine. Now, some people think he just wanted to keep the party going, you know, keep the party flowing. But as you said in Bible study, turning water into wine was a sign. It was a taste of what's to come the new wine in the kingdom of God. Jesus says he will not taste wine until he comes with the new wine of the consummated kingdom. Finally, in Mark 14, 26, it says, and after they sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now, this was typical because at the end of the Passover meal, before they drank the fourth cup of wine, it was customary to to sing one of the Psalms called Hallel Psalms, likely between uh, Psalms 113 and 118, but likely between Psalm 115 to 118. It was sing one of the Hallel Psalms. So after I wrap up and we share communion with one another, the new Passover, let's prepare to sing to the Lord, our new Passover lamb, a certain hymn, a certain song of praise. Now, my wife is from Philadelphia. More precisely, as she'll remind you, she's from West Philadelphia, born and raised. And her mother's nursing office is where she spent most of her days. Chilling out, Max, and relax. I'm joking, I'm joking. But she takes pride in being from West Philadelphia. And on many occasions, she has to remind me that West Philly is different from North Philly, which is different from South Philly, and so on. Apparently, they, they do things differently. But at the end of the day, they all have a Philly zip code. I used to live in Roxborough. And someone's like, hey, that's not really Philly. I was like, my address says Philly. I don't know what to tell you. It says Philadelphia, PA, right here. I don't know. <laughs> now, as you may know, when it comes to communion, Baptists are different from Presbyterians who are different from Lutherans and so on. We do things differently. But at the end of the day, true Christians of all stripes will all have a heavenly zip code. As we said, regardless of their borough, a lot of people from NYC take pride in living in New York. Or regardless of our denomination, we should take pride in living in a new covenant. A new covenantal relationship with God. Through the sacrificial blood of Jesus Christ, the prophesied new covenant that allows for the forgiveness of sins. A new covenant that surpasses the old. And although Alpha Baptist Church is in New Jersey, one day the Universal Church will be in the New Jerusalem. A heavenly city that shines with the glory of God, as we see in Revelation 21. And until that day, let us always remember to celebrate the new Passover, instituted by our Lord, our Lamb. May the Lord bless you and keep you.